aura that these fighters have. You, know, you may be beaten before you get into the ring. The Eastern European has become the dominant, shall we call it, species in boxing. I would say it's a phenomena from the Ukraine. Таранька – это пресная вода. Калидор. Игис he's got the best stable of fighters, I think, out there. The Eastern European fighter is still a new entity in professional boxing. Up until 1990, Eastern Europeans were not turned professional because there was communism and they were not allowed to turn professional. And even after communism fell, many of these Eastern Europeans, because of the culture, many of them were not turning pro still. Советский спортсмен победитель предолимпийской недели в Мехико. Но сейчас Баранников не сумел противостоять натиску грозного соперника. The amateur boxing program in the Eastern European countries is spectacular, it's wonderful. And that's why they've been able to produce so many great professional fighters. The Soviet bloc was a major force in the Olympic Games overall, because uh, the Olympic Games are for amateur athletes. In early 90s, in Ukraine, people would never see the difference between amateur boxing and professional boxing. Klitschko's were the pioneers when Vladimir became the Olympic champion in 1996 in Atlanta. Himself and his brother Vitaly, they signed a promotional contract with Universum Box Promotion in Germany. It was something new for our country and now Professional boxing is the number one sports in Ukraine. When you're selling an Eastern European fighter to the world in terms of his profile, once they gain Olympic gold, it's a lot easier to do that. Because, I, and I think if Loma and, and um, Usyk hadn't have, have won major medals, it starts to become a little bit harder. So uh, that was a big moment for their profile. A lot of these guys, to this day, still don't know how, how to properly turn pro. You know, there's so much talent over in Eastern Europe. I know what it's like to be a young fighter and have a dream. And if you don't have those doors open for you, you know, it, it, it could get tricky and it could be very frustrating, you know? So for those fighters to have uh, somebody like Igis to open doors for them and, and to have them get this huge notoriety as professionals the way they would deserve, it's not something that's done very easily. Well, ladies and gentlemen, if you would put your hands together one of the most powerful managers in boxing, he manages Vasily Lomachenko, Alexander Yusik, and of course, Sergei Kovalev. Please welcome the 2018 Boxing Writers Manager of the Year, Igas Klimas. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Los Angeles. Managers come in all shapes and sizes. They do different things. Some guys call themselves a manager and collect a fee and don't do anything. Uh, and then there are managers like Agus who, you know, live and die with their fighters, who really do get involved in whatever needs to be taken care of, who oversee their training, who take care of whatever the problem is at the moment. Um, Agus is a great manager. He knows what's achievable because he knows both sides of the coin. So he bats his corner for the fighters, but also he understands the market, the model, the broadcasters, the industry. I think that's what fighters like from a manager. They want someone that can navigate their career, but they also want someone that's emotionally invested. When I met Igus, I immediately realized that he was a serious person. 
It doesn't take rocket science to be a good manager. You have to be diligent, you have to care about your fighters, and Egus is all of that. Egus is about business, but business with a heart. The relationship with him, even he's a manager, like relation for me and him, I consider him as a friend. And I always like appreciate the friendship and like respect from him and from me to him is just yeah something some, something special. Wow, do you think we have time? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we can get through this stuff, Ellie. Well, basically, you know, I was born in uh, Lithuania. I wouldn't say I was very poor. I was grew up with a poor family. It wasn't a poor family. Unfortunately, I lost my father in a car accident when I was five years old. My mom got remarried, and we were uh, three kids in the family. I was 21 years old when my mom died. Back in the day in the Soviet Union, not too many people were very healthy. A week later, I joined the uh, Russian army in an uh, engineering department's battalion. It was 1989, summertime. Uh, I ran in one of my colleagues who was already preparing the documents to leave. Lithuania and go somewhere aboard. I didn't thought much, I know, like a week or two, and I made the decision, okay, I'm going. So I started preparing all the documents, all the paperwork. It took me like maybe two, three months, and I got the permission to leave. They took my passport away, so I was a citizen of nobody's, nowhere, so I had no citizenship, I had only one piece of paper with my picture on it and uh, was like, uh, I believe, three visas. So when I came to Austria, you know, when you're already in that environment, so you know, you're talking to people. So I heard from somebody what there is a IRC, International Rescue Committee. They said, okay, we have an interview at the United States Embassy. After that, I was granted to be a political refugee. That's how I ended up, 1989, end of November, Seattle, no friends, no family, English. Oh, I knew how to say I'm hungry, just in case. <laughs> I had $42 in my pocket at that time. And I remember us today, on the way from the airport, you come up up to the hill, and then you see the downtown of Seattle all those lights, when I saw all that downtown, I felt myself about like this bit. All those skyscrapers. And I gave to myself a question like, I guess what you're doing here? What are you doing here? And at that moment, if somebody would say, you can close your eyes and you open back home and count us, I probably would do it. Where he came from, originally to get to the place where he is one of the biggest power brokers in this sport. You don't see that all that often. Boxing was my passion. I used to box. I used to have a few, you know, a few amateur fights. And uh, then I came to the States. Of course, I was following. My first bout, I saw alive, 1992, Riddick both Evander Holfield. I, I bought a $800 ticket and I went to, to see a match. I think it was crazy. It was probably like the last money I had on my, on my, on my, <laughs> on my checking book. Beginning of 2000, I went to New York City. It was a heavy night. Only heavyweight was that night on a card. And the next morning somehow, Hotel or cafe, I don't remember, you know. I was sitting at a table and the next, next table was sitting uh, Don Turner, who was a whole field trainer at that time. And I kind of like, 
And he was like, oh, kiddo, where are you looking? We said, uh, we probably, I, you know, I recognize you, you're a uh, Holfin's trainer. And he says, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and he goes like, sit down, you know, let's talk about it. And you know, for me, it was like, wow, you know, something else. And I just sit down with him to have a cup of coffee. And all of a sudden, like, you know, four hours later, all we've been talking about boxing. And then he gave me his phone number. But he goes like, I know you guys have a lot of good fighters back in Russia, Ukraine, Lithuania. And uh, if you ever think about bringing anybody, I have a good training camp in North Carolina. I can train your fighters. That's how my boxing journey started. I think a lot of American fighters simply would not have the mentality to look at Oxnard as being luxurious. And if you take a look at Agus Klimas and his crew at Boxing Lab, they probably look at Oxnard in a certain way. And I, and I think that's a big key is that having the ability to be disciplined. Boxing Laboratory, I would say it's an international boxing gym. If you even walk into the gym, you will see a bunch of flags. It means somebody from that country was in the gym training or still in the gym training. Sometimes when I think about that, some countries are fighting in between. But these guys, when they come to boxing laboratory, they live like a brothers. These fighters who went to the Olympics together and now are in the professional game, and now they're world champions at the same time. And I'm talking about cruiserweight Usyk, light heavyweight uh, Vozdik, and Lomachenko in lightweight. Sometimes fighters go through weight divisions and they become world champions, but there's different world titles, so you're not always the top guy in your weight class. But I think you can safely say that Loma, Lomachenko has been the best champion in every weight class he's been to. Vasil Lomachenko is the best technical fighter since I promoted uh, in the mid-60s Muhammad Ali. Alexander Usyk completely dominated the cruiserweight division, now makes his step up to the heavyweight division. He is going to be a real force to be reckoned with, and I think he has the ability to do the, what he's done in the cruiserweight division into the heavyweight division. These guys come from a system where the amateur programs are excellent, far better than ours, and they are just better fighters. They come here and they can compete at the highest level with anybody we have. If you believe in the fighter and you believe the kid has great talent, then you want to test him and have him fight the best that he can fight, and that will make him into more than that's the ordinary good fighter, it'll make him into a star. And Igis recognizes it. He has a certain mindset that I'm going to bring you here to fight, but we're not going to babysit you for 30 fights. It's almost baptism by fire. And I think he takes pride in that. You want to have a, an aggressive approach to your career, but you also want to have an intelligent approach to your career. You also want to understand who you have and who you don't have, you know? With Lomachenko, they were very aggressive. This is possibly the best amateur that ever existed on the planet. In his second pro fight, it seemed to make a lot of sense, but you see what happened, he got beat. So you take the aggressive approach and it can be successful, and when it's successful, it looks genius. But you also risk putting in guys a little bit too early sometimes, and you know, some of those guys wind up taking a step back at times. We saw, we saw Maxim Dadashev actually passed away. Dadashev came to this country with a dream. Um, just to make a better life for him and his young child and to see that evaporate so quickly and so tragically. And, you know, I, I go back to that fight and Dadashev rallied in rounds 8, 9, and 10. It gave you just enough hope where I thought Buddy McGirt was very justified in actually letting the fight continue. But then after the 11th, you saw the dam burst. And in the aftermath of that, you know, it goes to show you, boxing is literally the riskiest sport on earth. Some guys are risking their lives. Some people die in the ring. 
I have experience of that. I've seen my guys knocking other guys out, which is died three, four days later, which is, was in coma for three, four weeks. My guy, Maxim Dudashev, died in the ring. They come here, they, they don't know what, what, is, what is waiting for them here. They just like playing a lottery. You can't come here and live life you lived back home. I came here, as I feel like I'm on a different planet, you know, it's a different world completely. I tried to observe everything, to discover everything, so it was really interesting. There was this perception that fighters from that part of the world, the Eastern Soviet bloc, were all Ivan Drago, that they're all mechanical, very stiff, they did not have a personality, and that they were not marketable. And I remember watching some of these guys, um, thinking to myself, these guys are okay, but I don't think they'll ever really fit into the professional world of boxing, at least not in America. And for any of these guys to have the commercial success that they've had, beginning with what I believe is the first wave, is Kovalev, Gennady Golovkin, Ruslan Provodnikov, and Lomachenko. To me, that's the Mount Rushmore. That's the first wave of guys that, to me, will always be looked upon as a certain marker in time when the business became more global. Initially, there was a rejection from that Eastern European you know, wave of fighters from broadcasters and probably promoters. You're bringing in a guy that has really no, that doesn't resonate with that audience, you know, coming into the US. Some of them don't speak English that well, but because of their quality, because of their ability, they couldn't really be ignored, you know? And I think that that's the reason that we've seen that invasion, because of how good those fighters are. I think the big test for Usyk is gonna be how he handles big, fast guys who punch very, very hard. You know, but let's not forget that in the World Series of Boxing, you know, throughout his amateur days, he boxed a lot of heavyweights. You know, so he's used to bigger guys. He can adapt to all styles. And now he's in, you know, commercially, the biggest division in the world. He can say a lot by not saying anything. Just his facial expressions, his body movements. As he likes to say, he's very feel. He's one of these quirky characters. There's almost like a mystery about him. I think that character cannot be properly quantified or properly measured as a talent, but it is a talent. There's just this mystery about these guys that, that like that, that sort of magician style, they're going to put a spell on you during the fight, and a lot of times they do. Language has no barrier for magic and entertainment. He doesn't have to talk. He can pull faces, you know, he can do tricks. He's a genius, a crazy Ukrainian genius. Do you want me to read the questions? Or you it's gonna... easier, I can just talk and then you repeat. Yeah, 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 let's, let's do it like that. 